Hello and welcome to this um, live forum as part of the ACFF Summit 2021. My name is Tim Newton and I'm going to be introducing and hosting today's session, which is um, Carries After Covid, Reflections, Plans and Ambitions. I'm delighted to be here with a very exciting uh, series of three speakers and a panel discussion with very eminent scientists and practitioners in the field. Um, so when we were putting this together, we felt that we were very much at a transition period in uh, dental care, where with the WHO um, resolution and the FDI vision 2030, both being brought to the fore. Uh, and post COVID, this, is an this provides us with an opportunity to think about making changes to the way that we've traditionally lived, uh, delivered um, dental care, and in particular, the diagnosis and management of caries. Um, so what's going to happen today is we're going to have three speakers um, who will deliver on the particular topics. Uh, and afterwards, we're going to move into a discussion phase, and we would love you to send us questions, which you can do um, by the Slido element on your screen, which is just next door to the player that's showing this video. So if you want to put um, questions in there, we'll pick those up and relay those to the panel after we've had the presentations. So without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Professor Nigel Pitts, who is going to be talking about um, the Alliance for Recovery for the Future. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Um, this is a, a live forum, and we've got some presentations before the live element. Uh, we're talking about caries after COVID, reflections, plans and ambitions. And my name is Nigel Pitts. I have the privilege of telling you about Alliance for Cavity Free Future, ACFF, in the caries space. So I want to divide this into reflections, plans and ambitions. And I'll have to go through this quite quickly because I want to share quite a lot of different concepts. The reflections are both the global and local aspects of what COVID has done. And I think we need both, and it's important to understand the differences. COVID-19, as an unexpected and very much unwanted change agent, COVID and the pandemic have changed a number of things in a way that can be quite useful. Then the last reflection is the strategic importance of evidence now viewing caries as an NCD or a non-communicable disease, and I'll explain why that's significant. In terms of plans, I want to highlight the ACFF King's Dental Policy Lab Network. Um, I want to talk about developing and implementing Caries Care International 4D, both as it was before the pandemic and now with adaptations such as the Caries Out initiative. And then continuing to develop partnerships. We've been developing partnerships with lots of the acronyms that you see there, the FDI, World Dental Federation and others. And it's really important in this time that we've been able to develop those further. And then I'll share with you the ambitions, which are both upstream, downstream, and making a difference in broader health. So without further ado, a quick word for those viewing this who don't know who we are. The ACFF is a global not-for-profit organization formed in 2010, seeking to promote integrated clinical and public health action to confront the disease burden of caries or cavities or tooth decay, depending on your language and how that's framed. And we're made up of a, a global team, a small global team, 29 different chapters around the world. And uh, as you see in the photograph in the center there, and global expert panel who advise us on an annual basis. And since 2013, we've been based at King's College London. So here's our ACFF chapter map. This is why we can think globally. We have 29 chapters now, and decade started in May 2011 with Colombia being our first chapter, and gradually we've built around the world until the United Kingdom comes in a little bit late, but we're delighted that a UK chapter is formed and launched uh, in this month. What the ACFF has learned is the importance of global adaptation. That's global evidence locally implemented. And you see here the Carey's puzzle. Um, the 
areas around the puzzle include nutrition, education, cariology, public health, clinical practice, but then looking at the details of caries management, but going then to action for other health professions, for the public, for patients and others. And we need to modify that beautifully symmetric puzzle into different ways in different parts of the world according to local needs. And the message here is that the way the pandemic has influenced countries, people, um, practice of dentistry and other healthcare is really very different in very different countries. You'll hear from Marco Vujic about the impact in the US, and, and that's a fascinating story, but the impact's different in different parts of the world, and I think we have to realize that. Then the, the pandemic's been a change agent, and we've got different um, different changes that will help and have already helped drive forward caries prevention uh, towards a cavity-free future. Those changes include how we think around health and how the public and policymakers think about health, the ability to contemplate change. There have been so many dramatic changes in policy that you wouldn't have thought would ever happen. Now there's an appetite for change. Attitudes to prevention and evidence have changed. The significance of oral health and what happens when you can't have oral health services has changed. And again, wide con uh, different country variations in both the impact of the pandemic and the views of the public and the professions and the policymakers. This editorial from 2020 was from Stephen Hancock being very quick off the mark to notice the contradictions between the way we look at and think about different diseases, the, the link, and, and this was a time of launching Carey's Care International, which you see on the right, the 4D system, and he made the link between COVID, Carey's, but at the end um, said very much that the most important C as we come out of this is collaboration, which is very much what the Alliance is about. The third reflection is caries as an NCD. And this may be an academic curiosity, but it now becomes really important. Back in the, I wanna take you through the journey, back in the early 2000s, the FDI Science Committee had a lot of debate with confusion and uncertainty. Was caries communicable in a classical way or could it be viewed as an NCD? A lot of confusion, a lot of different views. Back in 2015, before the Orca Caries Research Meeting in Brussels, uh, we had a, a debate um, with uh, uh, both, both parties putting up evidence for and against, and the experts attending that Orca conference shifted their view very significantly having listened to that debate, and we've now moved to 2021, where there is a scientific consensus that Caries is an NCD, but at the moment, many people are not aware of that. And there's a British Dental Journal focused issue on caries coming in November 2021. And there will be an article in there called Understanding Dental Caries as a Non-Communicable Disease um, with Swanti Twetman, Julian Fisher, Philip Marsh and myself. And we hope that that paper will help people understand. And the, the, the third of the key points is the one I want to get across today. Dental caries share similar risk factors with other NCDs and integrated prevention and management can have a positive effect, not just on caries, but on overall health as well. And in our Making Cavities um, History policy recommendations, this is one of the most important slides. It's one of the most important take home messages, caries and cavities can improve oral health and can improve and should improve general health and NCDs. And you'll hear later about the WHO resolution, but being part of the NCDs agenda is now very important strategically. So to move now to the plans, we have a, a dental policy lab network, which you will have heard about during the program for this virtual summit, that's driving and facilitating policy change. Then I want to talk briefly about Caries Care International and developing partnerships. So dental policy labs have been something that ACFF has been doing since 2016. And we've looked at moving towards a cavity free future by investing more in terms of resource allocation in prevention. We've looked at towards paying for health, paying for prevention. 
and we've looked at towards oral and dental health through partnership. Each of these labs had a, a special group brought together for 24 hours to work through what the policy change could look like. That led to, at the end of last year, uh, the Making Cavities History Task Force, 35 experts working together to co-create a global consensus on what policies we need to um, control caries and cavities. And that report was published in March 2021, and we expect that task force to continue to push forward both globally and locally. And it's a very special moment in time. And you'll hear more from James Taylor about the synergy between the FDI Vision 2030, the uh, WHO Oral Health Resolution. And that resolution makes very clear that a shift is recommended from the so-called traditional curative approach towards the preventive approach that many of us have been espousing for decades. The Dental Policy Lab Network will do three things. It will build on the earlier policy lab work to demonstrate the value of a cavity-free future. That's important for the public, but very important for policymakers as well as the profession. It'll develop a toolkit of methods and resources to help push these policy changes forward and the WHO oral health resolution forward, and then work thirdly with a number of exemplar countries to support progress and disseminate the learning. And in the center of all of that will be the ACFF's 29 chapters who can share the learning and the results. So to move on now to Caries Care International, the pandemic is now pushing uh, non-invasive care um, that doesn't generate aerosols. So the preventive and minimally interventive strategy that leads to less surgical intervention and less aerosol generation is now being looked at very carefully by people who were, let's put it this way, not looking at it before. And you see on this slide, the goals of ICCMS and Caries Care International, uh, looking to prevent new lesions, looking to prevent existing lesions from progressing and preserving tooth structure. This is very much fitting with the uh, FDI 2019 policy statement on caries. We've now got a range of editorials supporting this, a range of guidance, consensus guidance, and uh, Caries Care International has produced e-learning to help people um, put this into practice. And you'll notice this uh, uh, slide from the Caries Care website where we've got e-learning downloadable for free, how to implement the Caries Care International system, but very rapidly provided and with great tribute to the people behind it, led by Stephanie Martignon and others, we've got using CCI without aerosol generating procedures, these videos have been done in English and in Spanish and are available. And the exciting development with the UK chapter just starting is putting CCI in the context of delivering better oral health. Uh, that's a guidance, but also minimum intervention oral care. So integrating it into this wider philosophy for minimally interventive care. And then lastly, in this space, the Caries Out collaboration great to see 21 centres in 13 countries coming together to look at how we can manage caries uh, prevention and control post-pandemic using innovations, using teledentistry, using a whole range of pandemic responses. And then lastly, in this section, I just want to talk about building and strengthening our partnerships. Reflecting on it, what's really useful is we're broadening the partnership. So it's not just the classical dental ones with uh, International Association of Pediatric Dentistry uh, and others and the International Federation of Dental Hygienists, but we're now working with the World Federation of Public Health Associations at the top of that list and with the Sigma Theta Tau International Honor Society of Nursing. And nursing has got a lot to add to caries prevention and control on a global basis. But new partners, the Council of European Dentists, Platform for Better Oral Health in Europe, all joining in this um, important partnership um, push to exploit the policy window and opportunity that we have. And then lastly, 
to bring this together, the ambitions, that's what we've been asked for in this session. Um, we've got three ambitions in ACFF. The upstream one in public health is make cavities history through the actions I've been highlighting both globally and locally. So that's the upstream ambition. The downstream clinical practice ambition is make preventive dental medicine routine for caries care and to use the CCI4D system to do that. And then the third ambition is to broaden the alliances that we have to help reduce caries and cavities whilst also improving oral health and wider health. Um, and doing all of those three things in a changed para COVID-19 pandemic world. So that's what we're trying to do. Uh, and I hope that stimulates some discussion as well as tells you what we're doing and why. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Goodbye. I'm delighted to introduce our next speaker, who is Marco Vujicic, uh, who will be talking about the impact of COVID on dentistry. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Marco Vujicic. I'm at the American Dental Association. I serve as the chief economist and the vice president of the Health Policy Institute. I'm happy to share some insights today with you. Um, and obviously, sorry to not be there in person, um, about what we're learning or have learned so far in the US with regards to the impact of COVID uh, on the dental care sector, and even specifically some data uh, related to uh, cavities, which is uh, rare, but we were able to pull some stuff through there as well. So without further ado, I'll jump in. Um, and uh, again, I'm an economist, so this will be a, a data heavy presentation, um, but I promise it'll be uh, worth our while. One of the things that my group has been doing is as soon as the pandemic started, we instituted um, a large nationally representative survey of dentists in the United States. Uh, as you'll see in a bit, we then did this as well for a large group of dental hygienists um, in collaboration with the um, Dental Hygienists Association in the U.S. Um, and we did this every two weeks in the early stages of the pandemic, and then we moved this to uh, monthly. And what I'm showing you here is a snapshot of what the data are showing in terms of patient volume in dental offices. Um, again, starting um, in, in, you know, in 2020, in April, uh, all the way through um, last week um, here uh, in the US. So that blue line is, is, our, is our main metric of what's the volume of patients in dental offices. And as you can see, um, the dental sector closed for uh, roughly eight weeks um, from April to early May or mid-May in the U.S. closed for non-emergency uh, procedures. And you see on the left side of the, the, the screen that translated obviously to a significant decline in patient volume in the trough of the pandemic in terms of activity in the dental care sector. We were down to about 7% of pre-COVID slash typical patient volume. And as you see that ramped up and then is stabilized and ramped up again. And as you go all the way to the right, um, we're at about 90% of pre-COVID levels in terms of uh, patient volume. Um, and that is kind of, it's still going up slowly. Um, it's starting to stabilize. We'll, we'll have insights on why this isn't back up to 100% in a sec. Um, but anyway, the, the orange line is uh, what we call public health settings. So obviously in the US, there's different uh, mechanisms, how dental care is financed. There's a large private sector primarily and a smaller public sector um, working in publicly funded clinics. And that also basically is caught up. That's that orange line. Um, not much of a difference anymore. Anyway, so pretty strong recovery, I would argue for a sector that at the onset of COVID was 
targeted as high risk for transmission. Um, and, and basically, I don't know, from my perspective, economically, um, we, we've weathered the storm uh, in the U.S. quite, uh, quite effectively. Um, incidentally, we haven't seen major retirements, 99.9% plus of dental practices that were closed have reopened in the U.S. Um, so, you know, that was another fear uh, that didn't come to pass. Um, the interesting thing now is what the main challenges are in terms of practices. And I do want to highlight a little bit what we're learning about the recruitment challenges. And you'll see why this is really important in a second. Um, these, these numbers show in three waves in time there. And the most recent is the orange bar in August of this year. Uh, the percent of dental offices that are actively recruiting or have recently recruited uh, staff. So you see hygienists on the left, assistants, almost, you know, roughly a third of practices in the U.S. were either actively searching or had recently hired hygienists or assistants. Um, when we ask them how hard is it to fill these positions or how easy it is, um, we got some pretty startling results. So um, I don't know if this is happening in the UK and other settings, but there's definitely a hygienist shortage emerging in the US. So if you go all the way to the left, 90% uh, of dental offices that were recruiting or had recently recruited a hygienist reported it was extremely or very challenging, those top two categories. So again, dentists are facing major challenges in terms of hiring. Um, and again, in, in the US, it's largely privately funded and, and organized. So it's not like the government is recruiting. Uh, we know that it's the dentists and their, and their, and their practices that are doing the recruiting. Um, so major, major issue in terms of adequacy of finding hygienists. Um, and to the point where staffing shortages are the most common reason that dentists are saying they can't see more patients. So right at the beginning, um, I showed you the data saying we're back to about 90% of pre-COVID patient volume levels. And when we ask dentists, look, why aren't you seeing more patients? Uh, the top reason they give is I can't fill my vacant positions of hygienists and assistants. So when we look at the data from hygienists, um, very interesting results in terms of why they're not back to work. So in a nutshell, again, in collaboration with the Hygienist Association, we instituted a very large survey to track hygienists. And we asked them about employment and, and even COVID incidents, which I'll show you in a second. Um, but on the employment side, the top reasons that hygienists are giving for not coming back to work, and it's roughly about 5% of the workforce in terms of the hygienist workforce that's not back to work. The top reasons they're giving are general COVID-related issues, i.e. I'm waiting for the pandemic to subside. Um, some of them, the second reason is they're reporting concerns with workplace protocols and safety and risk of contracting COVID um, at work. Um, and then there's a list of things like, I don't want to practice hygiene anymore. Um, Childcare issues were much more prominent earlier in the pandemic. That reason has fallen down the list. Anyway, all this is available via ada.org slash HPI. My point of summarizing those data is that I don't think this hygienist shortage will resolve in the next few months. I think this is a longer term issue. Um, let me move now to a whole different data set. Um, we also wanted to track actual infection rates of the dental care team. Um, and, and obviously this is an epidemiological study that was led by our Science and Research Institute at the ADA. But again, we collaborated here uh, with the Hygienist Association. But what you see on the screen is just a snapshot of one publication. We've done a couple tracking COVID infection rates among dentists. And again, this was on the research side, something you know, me and my team and our colleagues in the science and research group in the ADA were very proud of. We put this in quick. Um, it was robust data. It's self-reported, obviously that has its shortcomings, but still it gave us a lot of information. Um, so 
let's just focus on the left here. And again, some, some details about the, the survey itself. But my point of this slide is that we, are, we also did this hygienist with hygienists. We started a little later, um, but a very large sample of dental hygienists as well. Um, and here's the, the, the punchline basically. So as of June of this year, 6.3% um, of dentists in the US and 7.3% of hygienists had reported ever being diagnosed with COVID. Um, so that's like a, a, a cumulative pre prevalence rate, we can think of it. Um, so from the beginning of the pandemic to again, today or the most recent data, we're in that six to 7% of the workforce having ever been diagnosed with COVID. Um, this is in line, as far as I recall, with roughly the population. It may even be lower than the population of the U.S. incidence and prevalence uh, prevalence rate. Sorry, uh, but more importantly, it's much much lower than any other occupations for which we could find data. Um, so it turns out that the dental workforce, when we started COVID, was predicted to be one of the highest risks. Um, for contracting COVID themselves. And it turns out that for various reasons, including all the mitigating factors and the, the protocols to keep patients and dentists safe, um, the, the incidence rate is far lower than for any other uh, healthcare occupations. Um, and I won't go through this, but we go through kind of which factors determined who got COVID and who didn't. Um, some of the important ones were what was the transmission rate generally in the community that you live and practice in. Um, and obviously, uh, PPE had a, had a factor too. Moving now to a third set, and I, I, this is probably maybe most relevant. Um, we also instituted and partnered with a group that surveyed the public on a monthly basis on a host of issues related to COVID. This was not an oral health survey, but what was really cool is we were able to insert an oral health component into a very large, robust, nationally representative survey of US households. And so we were able to get, again, self-reported data, um, but this, this is something I really wanted to share with the group. Um, we asked, or in partnership with this research firm, we asked the public or adults specifically, um, you know, since since before COVID, um, how have these dental issues changed for you? Um, are you experiencing more of them? No real change. Have these issues decreased? And I'm not really sure. So. Again, you can see a host of issues, one of them cavities there. So about 15% of adults reported that since the onset of the pandemic, they've experienced more cavities. Uh, there's 13% 13 13 that have also said less. Um, so that's kind of one thing, but you can see here kind of for the, for, you know, teeth grinding was obviously one of the top, top most frequent problems the public were reporting. Um, during the pandemic. Again, stress-related issues, cracked teeth as well. Um, but again, more just, I guess, from the research side, I think another thing we're proud of is to kind of get the data. So again, I've showed you data on the employment and economic factors and how much patient volume is changing month to month. Uh, second data set looked at the epidemiology, the incidence of COVID. Uh, among the profession. And then a third one is totally different. It's a data set sourcing from the public. Um, and again, on the profession side, doing this for dentists and hygienists gave us a real uh, robust picture of kind of what's been happening. So that's kind of a snapshot from an economist perspective of, of, of how the U.S. is kind of dental sector has, has uh, evolved or transitioned through the, the pandemic. Um, again, high level conclusions is, um, you know, economic wise, the, the, you know, by and large, the, the sector, you know, survived and I would argue even thrived. We, we did not see early retirements. We did not see bankruptcies. We did not see exits of dentists. Um, among hygienists, we are seeing lingering effects. We're seeing about 5% of the workforce still not back. Um, so that's not as robust of a return to employment um, as among dentists. Um, I think we're in the midst 
as a result of a, of a hygienist shortage that's limiting how much patients can be seen um, in dental practices. But again, by and large, where we were at the beginning of COVID and some of the more um, dire predictions and, and risks for the profession um, in the U.S., largely the sector has gone through pretty in a pretty healthy way. Um, in terms of the public, again, there definitely has been some effects on oral health, uh, including, again, a slight increase in what people are saying in terms of, of cavities, reporting incidents of cavities. Um, but again, the, the patient volume is recovering. I didn't show data. Uh, we also polled the public in terms of their perceptions of the safety of dentistry. And 97% of the public said they feel safe going to the dentist. Um, so the messages there have gotten out in terms of the safety protocols that are happening in practices and, and the collaboration the ADA did with the CDC, the national authority here in the government, um, to kind of put in those protocols and let the evidence drive that the, those policies. Um, really, really good um, in, in, in terms of a success story, in my view. Um, and, and again, I think the, the public has, has largely, you know, retain their confidence and safety uh, of, dental, of, of going to the dentist. Um, so there's a little data whirlwind. Um, hope this has been interesting and helpful. And again, thank you for having me. Thank you, Michael. And our next speaker is from Canada, uh, Dr. James Taylor, who will be speaking on the current global policy situation. Good day, my name is James Taylor, and I'm here today to talk to you about the current global policy situation in the context of which, which this virtual summit is taking place. Uh, I'm gonna talk about sort of how we got to where we are and why this is a very important juncture in time uh, to be having this particular conversation and how we can move the global oral health agenda forward uh, and in particular, the agenda of the ACFF. So let's start back um, in 2007 with a World Health Assembly resolution um, on oral health and an action plan for promotion of integrated disease prevention, which unfortunately uh, didn't end up translating into too much change in policy and programs uh, at the national level in various countries. And so moving forward to 2011 high level meeting on non-communicable diseases, then there was a statement made, but really again, that it, was, it was simply a statement and no real um, global action took place or, or really much action at the national level. Moving forward into 2015, uh, you'll all be aware of the development of the UN Sustainable Development Goals, number three being good health and well-being. And unfortunately, again, oral health had no mention in, in that. The 2018 high-level meeting in New York uh, for non-communicable diseases, again, no mention. And 2019, again, in New York, there was a mention in the universal health coverage um, and, and a political statement but again, it didn't really get much traction. And, and the problem with these is it's very difficult because again, the main primary actors for implementation of these are uh, governments. And um, very particularly, they have to choose which uh, action items from WHO upon which to act. And there's a series of activities here that generated um, really insufficient impetus for a significant amount of action to take place. So then come into 2019 and The Lancet had a very visionary publication, an oral health series of really global luminaries uh, in this area, but really showing that uh, the conversation on oral health is really part of a conversation on health. Uh, which we in the oral health community know, but sometimes it's a little difficult to communicate that to other communities. And The Lancet really put that sort of front and center. And so that's really setting a stage for further conversations. 
Uh, and they, of course, formed the commission soon thereafter. Uh, very important. And their commissions, as you know, are scientific review, inquiry, and response to an urgent and often neglected or understudied health predicament. So oral health at this point is becoming more part of the uh, global health conversation. Very important. And again, that lands up being a very important uh, publication. Concurrently, the FDI World Dental Federation is working on their vision 2030. Uh, again, a very important document and very timely because it's, again, against the backdrop of all these other activities uh, in its development, it's coming out at just the right time. And this group, of course, um, is having had a series of very valuable and important policy labs and publications associated with them over the past several years. Um, had something to offer in this conversation, and in particular, um, these key actions to be taken. And I really recommend that you read these. The link, uh, of course, is there on the slide. Which set the stage again for uh, last year's global consensus work um, with, again, a very um, well-informed group of international participants uh, coming up with, with a marvelous document. And then these two um, subsidiary documents, executive summary and policy recommendations. Because again, if in the dental public health community, uh, the realization has come that if you really want uh, your work and, and, and work towards improving uh, oral health, to actually have an implementation, you've really got to speak to policymakers. Those that develop the policies and programs, usually again, government-based folks. Um, and so again, a very important document to translate all this great work into terms understandable by policymakers. It was also done at a time when uh, ACFF was aware of the coming um, WHO resolution on oral health, which I'm showing here. Uh, again, over the last probably few years, the development of a director's general's report and a resolution, the work really uh, accelerating significantly uh, last fall, um, led by Sri Lanka and these other countries with significant support and participation, of course, by the office of Dr. Benoit Varen, who is uh, the chief dental officer of the WHO. They, they don't use that particular term, chief dental officer, but that's effectively what he is. And uh, that was circulated to countries um, in December. And all the countries who were able to have a look at this draft and, and make their comments and recommendations, such that it could go forward to the WHO executive board in January. And it was endorsed by that executive board, both the report and the resolution, which meant that it went forward to the full World Health Assembly um, later that year, at the end of May, and was very well received. And the Director General commented that oral health has been overlooked for too long in the global health agenda, which is a significant statement by someone of that in that position. And all countries had uh, interventions, as did from the um, global oral health organizations that have standing at uh, WHA, uh, FDI and IEDR had significant interventions. And I commend to you the uh, record of that at, at this link here at the bottom of the slide to have a look at uh, the FDI and IEDR interventions as well as the interventions by the individual countries. Very supportive of uh, the oral health resolution. And so uh, I, I did an over, overly simplistic, perhaps, summary of, of the elements here, but simply to, to fit it into one space. So resolutions like this have urges, calls, and requests. And in the urges, um, urged member states to address key risk factors around oral health, integrate oral health into national policies, reorient their approach from curative to preventive, um, reevaluate the oral health workforce, both in size and in composition and balance. 
uh, undertake national or health surveillance. In other words, cyclical gathering of data to maintain a picture uh, of the oral health situation of, of a country such that uh, evidence-based policy and, and program development can take place. Community water fluoridation and other preventive fluoride strategies, universal health coverage and access to oral health care, raising public awareness in the country. And then a call to treat oral health as integral to health. Again, for this audience, that all sounds very, uh, very easy, but unfortunately that's not always the approach that's taken in a number of jurisdictions around the world. Also encouraging cross-sectoral cross uh, collaboration between uh, other elements of health, uh, other, other institutional elements in, in pursuit of improving oral health. And also the oral health practitioners have a role in detecting neglect and abuse, which is uh, very important. And a request, and we'll go into uh, the publications in, in the next slide, the draft global strategy in 2022, an action plan in 2023, and then down to the Best Buy interventions in 2024. Uh, we'll talk about that in just a moment. But also for environmentally friendly dentistry, an example of which being, of course, um, compliance uh, with the Minamata Convention and the phasing down of the use of amalgam uh, due to obviously global mercury. Um, the uh, action of WHO headquarters in Geneva as providing technical guidance as a source of technical guidance for dental services, which, uh, which is a great idea. Um, recognizing NOMA as a neglected tropical disease, unfortunately, it had not been on what's called the NTD agenda uh, and therefore had not gotten um, the level of consideration that it might have, but, but now it has. And also uh, the fact that there would be uh, an accountability piece to this by reporting progress through the non-communicable disease reporting system up until 2031. So major, major uh, statements and very important. And I encourage you to look at that in detail at the link here at the bottom of the slide. So with regard to the next steps, again, uh, draft global strategy went out in early August to countries. Uh, seeking input from um, NGOs, institutions, and from national governments, deadline for which was the 17th of September, just passed. Um, and so that's, uh, I, again, I commend, if you've not already, I imagine this audience would already have read this, but uh, if you have not, that, that you read this. Once that's finalized, it will um, be the foundation for a global action plan for public oral health to come out in 2023, which in turn from the plan will be a series of best buy interventions. In other words, uh, sort of a menu of interventions that, that countries can take depending on their situation and their resources to improve the oral health in their jurisdiction. So some very important upcoming work. So we mentioned the uh, consensus document and the policy recommendations from ACFF around this. And again, this, the um, the consensus document was being completed at a time when there was an awareness of, of these drafts and therefore we we're able to map the ACFF policy recommendations uh, to the, the resolution. And recommendation one covers cross-sectoral collaboration, integration on national, national policies, reorientation from cure to preventive, oral health workforce balancing, and the raising of public awareness. ACFF policy recommendation two, covers cross-sectoral collaboration, addressing key risk factors, integration in national policies, reorientation from curative to preventive, and raising public awareness. Number three, maps to oral health integration to health, cross-sectoral collaboration, integration in national policies, reorientation, oral health workforce, community water fluoridation, and uh, other preventive fluoride strategies universal health coverage and access to care and the raising of public awareness. And finally, uh, number four covers integration of national policies and the national oral health surveillance. In other words, a, a, a cyclical, regular and cyclical uh, gathering of oral health data in support of policy and program development. And so uh, th this document uh, created by ACFF, consensus document, particularly the policy recommendations, 
are going to be able to, as, as those who are in decision-making positions, look to how to implement, this will be a very helpful document for those in those sorts of positions. This document also maps to FDI's vision 2030, and that, that's a whole separate uh, report to, uh, to be done at another time. And is also congruent with the IEDR's position on the WHO World Health Resolution as they published in their April 2021 journal. So very exciting times uh, and, and the next steps are very important, uh, which is what we're talking about obviously at this virtual conference today as all this work moves into sort of an implementation play, phase. How do we now make this such that direct interventions and actions can be taken uh, where, where they are needed most to have measurable effects on oral health. And looking forward to uh, further discussion on, uh, on that particular subject. So with that, I thank you very much for your kind attention and I uh, look forward to uh, speaking with you on the panel. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, James. Um, welcome back to the live forum. We're going to move now into our discussion piece. Um, but before we do that, I'd just like to give you a quick summary of the three talks that we've heard. Um, and then I'm going to introduce the panel members and then we'll move to our first question. And remember, you can submit your own questions through the Slido, which is just next to the video that you're watching at the moment. So we opened the session uh, with uh, Nigel Pitts who gave us an overview of the work of the Alliance for Recovery Free Future, um, which is operating globally through all the chapters all over the world with that stretched goal of trying to make cavities history. And I'm sure we'd love to hear more about that during the discussion. Then moved on to Marco, who gave us that fascinating insight into how uh, the COVID pandemic affects, affected the delivery um, and the workforce um, and the experience of dentistry in the US. And um, I was very pleased and delighted to see that uh, Marco feels that, um, I wrote it down, uh, that dentistry has survived and that there's been this recovery, but it's still, there are still some issues. And again, that has implications for how we move dentistry forward um, uh, on the agenda that we've been discussing. And talking about that agenda brings us on to our third speaker, uh, James Taylor, who beautifully set the scene um, for referring to a point I made earlier, which is that it seems like the time is now uh, ripe for creating system uh, change to support the goals that we have in relation to caries. Um, so fascinating three talks, really set the scene. And we have an amazing panel to discuss that. In addition to our three speakers, James, Marco and Nigel Pitts, uh, we also have um, Stephania Marquignon, uh, from Columbia. We have Avi Banerjee from King's College London uh, in the UK. George Sackles, who is from University College London, also in the UK. And Nigel Carter, who uh, represents the Oral and Dental Health Foundation in the UK. Um, right, so I'm going to start with Chair's privilege to ask the first question, um, which is that we, we seem to have um, this challenge of applying these global policies at a local level. And a little bit of information for you, we, our panel represents four different countries. We have people watching us today from um, at least 46 different countries. So how are we going to take these global policies, these global dreams that we have, and apply them locally? Um, Nigel Pitts, would you like to start with that? Thank you, Tim, um, and thanks to everybody for, for joining this forum. I think it's a great place to start, but it's not just global dreams. I think it's global evidence and a global opportunity. And as we've heard from James Taylor, there really is a lot going on at the global level that gives an opportunity to not only react to COVID, but to move us towards a cavity-free future. And the challenge we have, and it's a challenge that ACFF and its chapters have embraced, is how to take that global evidence about COVID, about caries, about NCDs, and how to make that real at a country level. And each country will and should and inevitably must be different 
because of the way in which the professional culture, the society, the health systems, the financing are all so fundamentally different. And so we must look, I think, at the global evidence, and it's great that we're synthesizing that and sharing that, but it's how it's picked up at a country level. And I think what might be useful is to hear uh, perhaps first from our most well-established, chronologically mature chapter in Colombia, from Stephania, and then perhaps to switch to Azri Banerjee and hear from our newest chapter in the UK, because these are two very different uh, contrasting local countries in which to solve the same global issue. So Stephania, in Colombia, how do you solve the problem? Okay, thank you. Yes, in Colombia, uh, with the Colombian chapter of the Alliance for a Cavity Free Future, we started with the academia, uh, first pursuing a um, curriculum for cardiology for the undergraduates, and that went very well already in 2012, and that has led now to um, La OHA, which is the Latin American Oral Health Association, also working together with the Alliance to uh, finding the way to have a Latin American consensus for the, the academy. Within the country in Colombia, um, the Alliance has uh, been now with the pandemic working with oral health promoters on uh, with teledentistry achieving the community that has not been able to access uh, the dental health services. And this is being done with teledentistry in four different uh, territories in our country. And um, we have been working with Universidad Bosque, starting a project with the Global Collaboratory for Caries Management to test the Caries Care International Management System. We were going to do it as a randomized clinical trial before the pandemic, and with the pandemic, we had to move towards a single group intervention, and we have 21 centers in 13 countries that wanted to keep doing it because they think it is important to have a caries management for the children throughout uh, the population, and also the opportunity to have more uh, remote uh, consultation. And it is interesting because of these 21 centers, um, at the moment, all the Latin American centers have been able to start. We still have um, some centers in the United States that have not been able because they have different ethical um, requirements. And in Europe, some of them have started. So this has been very interesting. With La Oja, we have also um, started a, a project to see how we can understand how um, fluoride toothpaste is being used among our countries, and also how we are on diet and sugar uh, intake. And first, we need to understand how the regulations are within each country. So we are um, working on this currently. Thank you. Uh, I think Nigel's um, um, pressed you the button. Thank you for bringing me into the conversation. Um, it's an interesting point because I'm going to step back slightly because the UK chapter is the youngest uh, chapter of ACFF um, and it's some interesting points that have been brought up um, in the presentations we've just heard about obviously the effect of the pandemic and Nigel made the point that different countries are going to have to behave differently to solve the same problem but we're all potentially starting from different points depending on how the country's uh, oral health uh, management was affected by the pandemic. So, for example, in the United Kingdom, uh, you know, in the heart of lockdown, uh, the dental services, oral healthcare services were really shut down. And that has then accentuated uh, a lot of problems that were perhaps already in the background. Uh, oral health in
Very foolish, but could I jump in on this? And, and I'm thinking sometimes that how different are we from what would have happened in another condition? If it wasn't oral conditions, if it wasn't oral health, we would still have the same challenge in the need of a global direction, but of a very much local implementation, exactly with different starting points and different conditions to address. So we are not in a Yes, it's challenging, but in, it's not very different from any other condition we would be facing. What I think is very relevant, and I try to jump in with, uh, on the point you mentioned, Tim, in the beginning, that the time is now. For me, it's a, it's a very different opportunity than it was many years back, and I, I think James referred to the previous one. The WHO, for example, hasn't said much about oral health for almost 15 years. It has spoken now, and it has spoken in a much more inclusive, uh, open way, and, and sort of incorporating oral health in a broader uh, health and policy agenda, in a public health message, which was very strong, um, in my view, and many other organizations. And you mentioned the FDR, the FDI, you think about the Lancet Commission on, uh, on Oral Health. It seems that the oral health community at large it's looking more or less at the same direction and thinks time is right for a change and, and putting the improvement of oral health of population and the reduction in inequalities in the agenda. Now, the implementation will be very different in different places. That's what it means to have an action plan and then break it down by regions. And then every region, like I'm from the, sort of we present the platform for better oral health in Europe, I'm interested in the European region more than anything, there will be a, a European oral health plan, and then every country would have to come and say, this is what we've done against the target we set. They don't have to be exactly the same target, but it means oral health is in the agenda. And, and, and the broader political, in terms of health policy framework, is that this resolution is not alone. It's passed together with the resolution on inequalities, on health inequalities, where again, oral health has a big role to play. It, it, it's a very big, good example of inequality. So it seems to me that the conditions, the, the background conditions are there um, for, for something to happen. Uh, so I, I view it as more positively. I know it's a challenge, but it's a positive one. James, I could see you nodding throughout there. Um, did you want to chip in? Uh, absolutely right. One thing we need to, uh, and, and you just mentioned, uh, a European, uh, a sort of a pan-European approach with, with goals and targets. Let's not forget, and I think I mentioned it in, in my talk, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals, which a great number of, of uh, member states of the UN have, have signed off on and are, and are approaching with regard to implementation uh, in their national jurisdictions differently. Um, one, one of the goals of this would perhaps be to, to seek to uh, in the presence of oral health in Sustainable Development Goal 3, which is, of course, health, and which has been mentioned in uh, a number of the publications, the ACFF one included. Um, and, and I think well, I think we need to keep that in mind as well uh, as another step in this process. And then you can go regionally. We hear about the successes in Latin America, and, and that's absolutely wonderful. Um, and, and they've done well, but they have uh, great influence in the Pan-American Health Organization 
and, and can potentially uh, resurrect the rural health agenda, for example, in, in that region. That's just one, obviously, of the, of the regions. There's uh, a number of regions, as you know, geographically around the world. So a lot of other pieces of this to think about to have end up getting into um, actionable policy at the local level. Thank you. Stephanie, do you want to? Yes, um, I think I, I agree very much with George, and I think it has been an opportunity, uh, not that we like it, but with, uh, through the pandemic and also the WHO resolution and the FDI have helped us to um, get the SDF, uh, sodium, the silver diamine fluoride in Colombia because it is not regulated, but as it is in the WHO resolution mm -hmm. as an essential medicine, even the Ministry of Health is uh, trying to have us as a university doing a research project to show that it has to be regulated. And that's something that is totally policy to push forward something to stop um, cavity from happening. And I think that also will help for the inequality. So we are using that as an opportunity. Yes. Thank you. Uh, if I could come back at some point on the stakeholder involvement. I'm thinking we have different regulatory systems, uh, which is obviously challenge, but do the economics, the different economic systems that we have for dentistry uh, and healthcare, do they that, think those are going to be challenges in, in implementing these global goals? Uh, yes, I wouldn't say it's more economic, it's more, again, how we set up our health insurance systems and where dentistry fits into those. I think that's the interesting diversity we have across the world, right? Um, and I would argue even in heavily centralized public insurance systems in like Canada where I'm from, dentistry still by and large is kind of outside uh, that, that core coverage universal healthcare system. And obviously the, the resolutions in WHO this year are trying to change that. So I would say the exciting thing to me to tap into what, what I think George was saying about what's different is we also have paired this um, focus or realization on the importance of oral health and cavities specifically with also an era where we, I think, are finally seeing that oral health ought to be covered as a core health care service. So that changes, obviously, the economics. And once you have insurance for these services, it becomes a lot easier to do kind of what, what ACFF is trying to do. So I would say the economic headwinds are favorable in this case. And uh, in, in, in you know, what's different now compared to 10, 20 years ago? Thank you very much. That's, that's good. Um, thank you. Um, picked up on Abby's um, point about stakeholders. Um, it strikes me that there must be a very broad range of stakeholders required to be involved. And uh, James, you're as somebody who's obviously been very active and very experienced in implementing uh, policy. Who do you think are the relevant stakeholders in, in, in this role? Oh, my goodness, uh, big question. Um, but I'll try to do a short answer. Um, the key, the key, again, it's going to start at the WHO level and with the global oral health organizations, and, and we've given as examples, IDR and, and uh, FDI, and of course, ACFF. Um, but then well, it needs to be picked up really at the national level because, of course, the member organizations of, let's say, FDI or the National Dental Associations and, of course, the other regulated oral health professions in various national jurisdictions. Uh, and then it's really a conversation with their their national policymakers to on, on how that's going to be a good fit for their national jurisdiction. Again, no one solution across all countries, obviously. And that the ACFF implementation um, strategy sort of speaks to that. But again, we can't forget also that we have um, ACFF elements in a great number of. Um, uh, regional and national jurisdictions around the world, and they can be active um, 
in this conversation as well, both with the national associations and with um, the government on this. Can I say something? I think I'm third sector in terms of being. I think it's. I mean, it's quite natural in what we're doing with health professionals that this is an area that we're passionate about and we're interested in. But I think the key thing here for me is that for success, it's really got to be from influencing the policy makers at the top, and we may be well be in the best position to do that. But it's also got to be driven by not only the patients who are entering into practices, but the public as a whole, and dealing with those who don't attend on a regular basis. We're very well aware of the um, disparities within all health status across communities, and, and that has to be addressed if we're going to achieve a um, real traction there. So it's fine as all health professionals uh, as academics being passionate about it and wanting to put it forward, but we've got to engage all these communities from the public through awareness. And I think the public, um, well, I'll, I'll flip the question back to you in a minute to as a, uh, a psychologist, but it's about attitude change and behaviour change. And the change that I would like to see is that public and patients change from thinking that dental practitioners are responsible for their own health uh, and that the repair shop is going to look after them to realising that the 360 days plus a year when they're not in a dental practice, they're actually in charge of things. And there the corporate sector has a role to play as well in terms of the provision of um, or hygiene products and the education that they can do on a broader basis through things uh, like advertising campaigns. Then we go up to the, the, the local policy level where local communities have to be involved. But even from the practitioner point of view, there's a huge behavioural change and attitude change piece to be done there to change from the attitude that they are going to pass off and what they're there to do is repair things, to move to that preventive situation and to look after and support their patients through that preventive journey for the 360 days that they're not in practice. Lots of ways that this can be done these days through social media, through digital campaigns, through continuing contact with the patients. So it's changing the model of delivery. So flipping the question back to you, how do you think we get that behaviour change for both dental care professionals and the public as well? Thank you, Nigel. Um, yeah, that's a really interesting question. Thank you, Nigel. I think, uh, I think uh, one of the things that I'm quite interested in is, is something you hinted at is about creating the, um, the opportunity for health-related, for all health-related behaviour to be easy. So for very simple things like we're uh, in, our, in the United Kingdom, we charge VAT, value added tax, on all health products. So removing that would just make things a little bit easier. We have the sugar tax, the sugar levy. Um, so create, creating those circumstances that make things simple. Um, uh, but I think one of the challenges we have is the one you've put your finger on. Uh, this kind of idea that actually dental, caring for my dental health is not quite yet viewed in the same as caring for my general health. I think people are much, have much more feeling of being empowered to do it. So how do we make that shift? Um, so thank you. Um, yeah, because we're hearing that obviously there's many different strands to the same sense of change. I think one of the things we also need to consider is messages and communication. How do we communicate to the public all these things we want to influence and change behaviour? And I think, you know, dare I say it, the media have actually quite a responsibility here as well. And that's not just in the UK, but that's global. Um, so that's put a, a difficult situation as well. It's not an easy fix, but I think we need to get them as a sector, as a stakeholder involved. Um, because that messaging is everything. Because if they can help us, 
then it reinforces all the things that Michael Parker has said, that, that Tim has said, and everybody else, to, to pull it all together. Because they do really control a lot of what the public then perceives as what is all health and what the roles are of the profession and, and all the stakeholders. So I throw that into the mix just to get an understanding. In a way, we are thinking about why there is stakeholders, and, and it cannot be wide enough. But sometimes it's also part of our central silo, our world health silo. So we're thinking in terms of different specialties, uh, of academia versus or with practitioners, of um, policy makers around oral health. While, as a matter of fact, the, the field is broader. Um, when the resolution calls about oral health as part of the universal health coverage, it, I think it thinks about primary care, very much so. It thinks about public health in general, not just dental public health. I'm not because of dental public health, but it, it, it talks about public health in general. You referred to uh, very correctly about the sugar level, about the sugar tax. Um, this is an area where the oral health community provided all the books, all the ammunition, all, uh, not all, but a big chunk of the evidence that informed that policy decision. But we have been relatively shy, I think, in, in how we implement, how we evaluate, who we work with to be implemented. And, for example, Nigel referred to the public very correctly, so we tend to think of the public a lot of the time as someone that receives our messages. Not just someone that co designs them, not just someone that owns them. So it, it requires us to think quite differently and involve them. But we do it, we're doing it in many occasions. So if you are going, and, and many researchers who work in UK airports, they don't just go and pass the message on, they work with the stakeholders, for example, the, the staff members, the care home manager third sector organizations that work in aging, not necessarily oral health, but they are convinced about the importance of oral health, to co-design the vast, very simple message, like the message that Stephanie said that she made, practice. So I think the idea of a global alliance, if you like, that goes beyond our own minds. Nigel in his, Nigel Pitt's in his previous presentation, he was talking about um, Paris in the NCD now, Paris is the most prevalent in CD. Oral conditions are quite prevalent in CD. We should be working, for example, with the NCD alliance together, uh, not just uh, looking at oral health in the room, but wider. And I found just a final point of a personal experience working with the platform. We got um, the European Forum for Primary Care one of its members, and it has been a breath of fresh air. Because suddenly they have started talking about the importance of oral health. I think this is how we will measure our success in including wider, exactly as I have said, uh, stakeholders. But I'd just like to build on that as part of the conversation. And, and it picks up a couple of the themes that I started with in, in the first part of the presentation. We've got to do two things at the same time, exactly as George was saying. We need to engage out of our dental silo, um, and we as ACFF are engaging with the World Federation of Public Health Associations and getting caries and cavities as an NCD on that agenda. And we're working also with nursing organizations who are fascinated in many countries wanting to know how they can contribute to improving caries and cavities as part of their interventions as sort of a public health and nursing intervention. So we have to move upstream and exploit this opportunity. But the real challenge is at the same time not to disconnect from the whole of dentistry, but to find a common language and a common message that can work both upstream and downstream. And that sounds very simple, um, but it really is a challenge. And I don't think we've been very good in dentistry at being able to do that. So it's one of the ambitions for ACFF is to be able to engage in the upstream agenda, just as George has said, 
but also to have some sort of common message because it's not just the public, it's the policymakers who say, well, if all the experts can't agree, it, you know, we can't, we can't just move forward with policy. If all the experts disagree, it's a mess. Let's go back to something easier like diabetes. Diabetes is important, but they get their messaging better together. And I think we need to do that. Please, to give credit to the oral health community, we have got our communication message better lately in terms of how we approach policy makers. We used to be bombarding them with BMF figures, which for us means a lot, but for them means almost next nothing. Uh, and now, more often than not, it is about the impact of those on individuals, on society, on economies, but the burden in terms of cost on uh, disability just like here, etc. So I think it's moving. It is moving. There is an opportunity, but I uh, I still think we can do that. Uh, I want to come back to the point. I think it's implicit in something Abby was saying and something Marco was saying. It is um, this notion about sustainable work. And that may differ in different settings. And how to how to engage the, the, the workforce of this sector. Right now, I'm looking at the two of you. Who got to go first? Do you want to go first, Abby or Martin? Yeah, first, first, can I just, uh, I get to that, uh, but something Nigel Carter said, I really want to just give, give a quick thought on. So, is it to how to change the behavior away from the, the repair shop mentality? I want to emphasize how important it is, in my view, that payment reform um, is one of the key aspects of that. Honestly, if you start changing how you reimburse providers, uh, you will see a change. So right now, largely, the dental team is, is paid for repairing things, right, to use Nigel's you know, analogy. Um, if you start now a little bit reimbursing for being cavity free, or even just recording data about carries risk, let's say something very straightforward, you will see some changes. So that's something directly in the hands of, in this case, payers as a stakeholder, either on the public side or the payer side. Um, back to this issue of the dental team, it's fascinating work for this because here in the U.S. Um, we're having a debate in Congress about expanding coverage to seniors, to older Americans, um, for dentistry, for oral care, um, through the large public program called Medicare that insures 65 and older Americans. And it's fascinating. I think it really, it really has forced some viewpoints about the role of the workforce uh, to come forward. Like, a lot of dentists, like the fact that dentistry is separate and it's not necessarily governed by the same regulations as, as mainstream healthcare. Um, my point there is you cannot have it both ways. You cannot be achieving what we're talking about here in terms of, you know, eliminating cavities and, and trying to get dentistry and the universal coverage and trying to promote collaboration between the oral health care team and the rest of the health care system. I mean, it's, that's inconsistent with the view that, oh, dentistry is a great career because it's separate and it's less regulated and it's less to do with insurance. So I really feel there's somewhat of a, um, I don't know, a, 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 an inconsistent vision here among what the health care team is going to be. And that, I mean, that's going to be resolved, and that's purely a, like a political economy type of thing. Um, but honestly, here in the U.S., it's, it's, it's been a struggle this last uh, few months, just kind of with, with, with this viewpoint about, okay, you know, how, how integrated ought to dentist, uh, should dentistry be? And I'm not at all, you know, seeing a massive consensus among the profession on this. Um, so, I guess my point is this will evolve, right? As reforms evolve, I'm, I'm a big believer that the workforce adjusts, right? It's not necessarily the other way around that the workforce is driving what happens. Um, so, again, there'll be bumps in the road, but it's certainly, I think, something that 
you know, if you did have a universal reform that brings dentistry into USC, in the universal coverage, I think the workforce would adjust. Maybe the team composition would change. Um, so that's kind of one aspect I wanted to bring into the workforce discussion. It may not have been directly the question, but I think it's important. The idea that policy will drive the workforce. Right. And, and to add uh, what Marco said, which I, I completely agree with, I think it's an interesting point that there's also a generational input here. Because if you yeah. look at the, the more senior in the profession who are more traditional, they will look back exactly as Marco said on this idea that dentistry is, is a silo and it's a career in itself. If you go back to what Stephanie was saying right at the beginning about education and educating the younger workforce coming through, they are being trained more, certainly in the UK, I, I, I can speak for, they are being trained more collaboratively and to work as a team and to delegate duties and to, and to work in that sphere of different expertise. So that actually then optimizes the care delivery for the patient and the patient gets the best care. Rather than one person trying to do everything, you get different groups who are trained specifically to do certain things, but all talking to each other and communicating in a network manner. Um, so certainly that's happening in the UK in terms of what's happening at dental schools and the way uh, different uh, oral healthcare team members are actually being trained literally in the same room, in the same facility, by the same teachers, which I think is a massive positive. Um, but I completely agree with Marco that it, 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 um, the, the remuneration systems are the systems for awarding what is delivered have to change, and that idea will change things overnight. Literally overnight, we'll suddenly see more prevention, uh, that, that whole drive coming forward in terms of the professional side, and it then gives us the momentum. Yes, and I think that's one very important point is this about change behavior, but inward. I think that we maybe have changed expenses on being uh, less restorative, but uh, what I see from my experience with other dentists is that it's very hard to learn to, to learn how to change behavior and how to go across oral health education. And dentists don't know how to deal with that. They know now how to stop drilling, but now how to give the message about uh, fluoride toothpaste use, uh, avoiding sugars, and I think this is something that really and it is related, of course, to how we have been paying the dentist and also at the school, how we have been qualifying in the clinic, only drilling and so on, and not this other bit, which is very important. If I could pick up on the last two parts of the conversation, firstly, just to thank Marco for bringing up the payment issue, because um, we've been having conversations for 10 years in many countries about how to change behavior while ignoring the payment uh, driver, which is just idiotic, but that's how we've done it. Um, I think there's some very useful developments coming from the policy lab and driving change and understanding what the choices might be. Um, I also think this is a really useful discussion, and I want to go to James Taylor in a moment if I can, because we need this conversation to understand the U.S. dynamic, to understand what's changing at the moment in real time, as well as Colombia, as well as the U.K., as well as Europe. Um, but I think we need to share a menu of options, a menu of worked examples about how to do this, because no one system will work in every country. That's perfectly clear. But having heard from the U.S., I'm curious in, in Canada, the, the system is different. You, you're approach to WHO and universal health coverage is different. How does that play out in Canada? And, and if I could draw you also a little bit into the Dental Policy Lab network, what about these menus of work examples? Do you think that can help? Yeah, I, I'm going to have to sit back with that one a little bit because I'm not here as a Canadian day. I'm here as the Secretary of the FBI uh, Chief General Officer's section. Um, 
but, but obviously, again, it's different approaches in different jurisdictions. Uh, the first thing I thought of when you talked about payments was that wonderful policy lab publication you had on, on the involved payment system. And I know there's some great conversations around that. And although, again, I can't speak to the details because I don't work on private practice side, that's obviously uh, at the strategic level, Marco's uh, domain, it, it is an important piece. Um, when we're talking about workforces, uh, there's a lot to be learned from how let's say New Zealand and the UK have dental therapists as integral uh, and, and frequent uh, members of the oral health care delivery team, and, and that's just, just normal there. And other, other jurisdictions, uh, particularly in, in North America, are, are starting to look toward that. But that workforce balance is an important conversation as well. For those of you who may not be familiar with the work of Marco Magabe, um, he uh, works in science and he's got a randomized control trial in his hands, which is at uh, different world pains and to, to promote prevention. Now, can you, it, it's a national demonstration project on paying dentists for prevention. And what uh, Marco Magabe has managed to do is to take the results of the second dental policy line on paying for health and dentistry and persuade the French government to set up a three-year um, multi-million euro demonstration project on how to do that for 23 to 25 year olds with the expectation that learning in three provinces about how to do that, they can then roll out uh, a refined, localized national system and he's taken the policy lab recommendations and the Care Care International system and localized that in a way that's seen as acceptable in France, which I think is a tremendous achievement in about 18 months to two years flat. So that's a great success story of changing how you pay dentists and doing that with dental associations and with policy makers and with government. Um, I've got a number of things on mind before time, but I will start with what I think may be the most naive. So we tend to talk a lot about remuneration and less about reward. Do you think we should be thinking about a broader system of reward for being for working in this field, rather than this one tool we have of remuneration? Um, anybody want to speak to that? I'm thinking about the implicit reward for uh, like the sense of autonomy, which obviously somebody talked about that sense of value in the past. But the recognition of being part of a profession that's moving forward with really valued goals. I look around this room and I don't think you've all been like, remunerated for your incredible efforts on this sort of piece of work. But the agreement for some other reward. Marco, what, is that feasible or is that complete now? I mean, the way the way an economist would look at it is there's you know financial incentives, non-financial incentives. I mean, I use rewards and if the remuneration is pay, and then there's non-pay aspects. So, I mean, yes, obviously the everything from the work-life balance, sense of autonomy. We do know from the research that, that is one key factor attracting um, people into dental school and into into oral care profession. Right. Um, but again, just I want to go back to my thing that 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 is not kind of set in stone. Like, in, for example, in, in the U.S. and Canada, somewhat, you know, the type of person that went into medicine 30 years ago is not the same person going in today. It's not a field anymore where you are running your own business and separate and, and kind of controlling your work hours, so to speak. Um, it's become um, uh, largely employed in large groups, um, you know, with less clinical autonomy and, and more kind of standard standards of care, so to speak. Um, so my point is, again, the workforce will adjust to what the policy reform ends up being. I don't, I don't think we should be stuck by saying, oh, the workforce is a big constraint and and, you know, I, I don't know who said it earlier on the panel, right? But there's a huge generational divide. Um, so, yes, to answer your question directly, there are important non-remuneration factors that
that makes the profession attractive. Um, and it's got people that want to, you know, help people as well, um, beyond just kind of what the career is like. But again, as the environment changes, it'll adjust who goes in. And I don't see any sort of threat there in terms of potentially changing who gets drawn into dental school. Um, that's our autonomous with Jacob, but let's let's hear from maybe some of the dentists and some that are in the academic environment. Okay, we're throwing ideas out here. Um, I, I like the idea of uh, moving towards a reward, and I would actually add incentivization into that. And I think, again, Marco, one of the key words he's using is the word career. Um, dentistry or healthcare isn't a job, it's a career. And it's a career looking after other people, but it's a career also looking after yourself, I would argue. And a, a way of incentivizing and rewarding is to look at potential career progression and, and pathway to that, which people haven't really done, especially when we talk about prevention and, and, and all the sort of minimum intervention aspects that we're talking about. So one of the roles I have now in the UK is with the new College of General Dentistry, and that's really looking at reforming career pathways in our profession across all members of the healthcare team, not just dentists. And I just wonder, you know, as it's not always about money. You know, there, there's other things. The behavioral psychologist, you know this better than any of us. There are other things that drive people who want to excel in the work they do. Um, obviously, financial is one, but I, I would argue it's quite a small one, really, in the grand scheme of things. And if you can develop your profession, um, develop your own role in that profession, and, and, and build through a career pathway, I think that could be a very exciting, different approach of incentivizing uh, people. You know, in, in the United Kingdom, we have specialist programs. Okay? You look at them all, what do they do? They train people to cut teeth better. They train people to do procedures better. All right, um, as I said, I'm stirring up a bit of a discussion here. That's why we're here. Um, why don't we actually train people to care for people better, more holistically, bringing the mass back into the body, linking with general health, and all these sorts of things? And if you actually make, dare I say it, that a specialism in inverted commas or whatever phrase you want to use, might that also drive change, not just because of the way it's been remunerated? I may be wrong, and I'm happy to, you know, to be shouted down, but I'm putting that out there as a discussion point. I would very much agree with um, Abby there in terms of getting away from the focus that the profession has on delivery of widgets. Uh, it's got to be reward for health. And perhaps even actually to be very controversial in the title of the life of a particular future. Looking at the audiences that we were talking about early on, what does a cavity free future mean to them? Is it translated to be relevant to them? Is it something that they want? Uh, or is that again the dental professionals navel gazing because it's what we would all like to see with people with no cavities. But what does it mean to the policy maker? It means to do cost to the economy, reduce time off work, etc. etc. What does it mean to the patient? It means being comfortable, having a healthy mouth, not having some of the um, later life or systemic conditions like early onset of dementia. So there's I think that it sort of needs translating and selling to those different audiences, perhaps in a different way, and, and getting out of the central silo. Because unless we can take all those audiences along, the profession, I think, is going to be relatively little. But certainly, back to Eric's point and, and Marco, they will definitely, the quickest thing that the profession reacts to is a change in the patient. So if somehow, we can come up with a reward system or a remuneration system that is actually rewarding them for health, not disease. We'll have gone a long way to achieving what we want to achieve. I really like uh, what I've heard before um, in, in terms of 
career as a job. I would fully agree on that. And, and a, a, a reward system um, that sort of looks towards prevention uh, and fits the balance uh, from the current model. So it could anyway fit in, but it could fit faster, if you like. Um, and that's really good. And I think Marco is spot on when he says, well, we can't make any change when we don't touch the, the most easy and effective uh, weapon you have in your hand, which is a, the payment system. But, and that's really, really important. We would still leave out a big chunk of the population, the one that would be mostly in need, actually, that wouldn't receive service. Uh, and and uh, I want to put it for the discussion. Think what it means, the success we have in terms of improvement of oral health, uh, what it means for the future. Think, for example, uh, the current cohort of people aged and older adults. There's very little compared to the past. There's not very little uh, in absolute terms. There's very little identity compared to the past. It goes lower and lower. That means that a greater, much greater proportion of people my age and above would have many natural teeth in the mouth, heavily restored, with many, many high needs for restoration, and very, most likely, going to live longer than the parents. Now, if I was a health planner, I would say that this is a time bomb. It's similar to the diabetes time bomb. We cannot put diabetes at the end of the We have to prevent it. Prevent it. It's impossible to treat it. It's, there's no resources for that. Well, how would there be resources for exceeding costs due to the demographic and epidemiological position in oral health? Unless we fix prevention earlier, we look at public health intervention earlier to maintain a, a functional, healthy beneficiary in later life. So it's not just about who visits. That's very, very important. It's also who doesn't. Uh, and, and when you look at the different studies, even national studies, which Nigel was part of a consortium that does the national epidemiological studies in this country, in the UK, um, we always look at inequalities and social gradients across. Of course, all those studies recruit the sample from uh, the standard population. The most vulnerable groups tend to be heavily underrepresented. They are not there. So the, the, I want just not to forget, while we think about the remuneration system correctly and payment system and, and, uh, and rewards, I want us not to forget that there is an iceberg behind that system. Okay, I'm going to go with uh, James and then I'll go yeah, I guess I, I want to, in hot pursuit, so we're, we're talking about the general economic side um, as, as one for perhaps more to bring the conversation. Is it accurate to say that, that we're in a period of unprecedented um, student loan debt for those choosing a career in, in dentistry in a number of global jurisdictions? I, and I, I know you, you look across the world a little bit, but specifically the U.S. And how is that uh, affecting this conversation around um, expectations and practice patterns and, uh, and remuneration? So, in so again, we, we've only looked at the U.S. data, but yes, I mean, student debt is at all time highs. It's not a dentistry specific trend, it's happening in all sorts of professional occupations in higher ed in general. Um, my take, James, on the research we've done and others have done is that, yes, it, it does drive some career choices, but the, my take is on the research that the effect of student debt is quite small in comparison to other things, like the, the gender shift or the, you know, the fact that there's more non-white dentists. So, like, race, gender, and whether your parent was a dentist turned out to be really big factors on what type of practice you're in and whether you accept public programs and whether you own a practice. So, long story short, my take is that the debt is not, like, a big barrier, nor is it as big a driver of career choices as maybe perhaps you think. Um, so, I wouldn't put it, like, in, the, in, in let's say, something that may prevent what, what the panel's been talking about, uh, this type of trajectory and this transformation. Thanks.
just want to pick up on three points of the conversation. The first, um, just to your question, Tim, about payment and direct financial incentives and non-financial incentives. I think it's really important that that conversation happens in many, many different countries. Uh, and we have to find a locally appropriate way of doing that. And we're tending to focus on high-income and well-developed economies. Let's think also about the low- to middle-income countries. And how do we prevent countries following in the footsteps of other countries who perhaps speed it up? Um, there's a really unhelpful attraction of following the developed world, including following them safe. And if we can sort circuit that, the, the benefit of everybody, including the members of the health profession, is great. So I think that balance of pay and professionalism, and in the policy labs, what was really interesting is the whole debate came back about professionalism and what that means in 2021. So uh, that's important. In terms of the what George is saying about the healthy, and we'd like to keep them gently and orally healthy, dentate adults that would have lost their teeth as they get to an older and older age, and then polypharmacy. In the ACFS world, the Nordic chapter and the Japan chapter have got some really good lessons of how to deal with that. And I think it is a time bomb, and we're not looking at it, and we should, so I totally agree. And then the final comment about going back to Marco's point about the workforce response, the younger generation, if you look at what's happening in medicine, and I think it's happening in, um, in dental professional uh, academic programs, a lot of young doctors and a lot of young dentists don't want the same crazy work-life balance that their predecessors have had. They don't want the same priorities. And actually their agenda in terms of sustainable development goals a much more sustainable, green, planet-friendly, changing the way they want to work and live. So let's feed that into the debate and not look about perpetuating what we've currently got and look at sort of future gazing and future planning in a locally appropriate way. So that's just my contribution. And wouldn't be described to what Nigel was saying. Wouldn't it be interesting to uh, learn from the things that happen in your way. So, for example, you were mentioning before um, Michael Margaret's project. Uh, now, once it's fully evaluated, and you, that knowledge is, is very useful not just for science. It's, it's useful knowledge in general for others to adapt and maybe try something similar. And, and maybe not find exactly the same result. That would be a, a, a important knowledge. So, a, a best practice approach where we, we share experiences and knowledge um, uh, in terms of policies of, and how they work. I, I think it's, it's something like organizations like the ACFS are in a very good place to um, facilitate that's what we hope the Dental Policy Lab Network will do. So, um, just a couple of comments from our team. Uh, the first one is saying that the workforce has changed from individual practice to businesses. Um, I don't believe we're looking at this just too much, and that's a really important point. I think something Marco mentioned as well, the change from that sort of being an individual dentist to a business. Uh, and of course, the other point which is very important um, is other dental care workers are not just dentists. I think we need to think about that, and particularly on a global scale, because it may be that the most appropriate workforce is not always dentists. It feeds into what as that's um, been communicated back to us, it's other dental care workers, not just dentists. I would say not just dental care workers, other health workers, which I think is probably what's behind the suggestion. It's an all health care team, and it's actually wider than it's all wider health. health it's, it's also general health and everything else. And I couldn't agree more with that statement. And I think in different jurisdictions around the world, I think. Uh, as, as, as James intimated, there are different developments and some jurisdictions perhaps are slightly behind, some are slightly ahead of the curve on that one. And again, it needs that, that balance and that drive across globally to, to push that agenda. I completely agree with that statement. 
Okay, we're down to the last two minutes of discussion, and I just wanted to raise another point, which is um, just as we think that perhaps the expectations of people joining the profession have changed, do we think the expectations of patients in terms of their interaction with healthcare are changing? Um, who'd like to pick that up? Marka, you've spoken eloquently before about the rise of consumerism. I would just say yes, and you know, as many of the panel have said, this it's a generational thing. So I think we're about to see that really accelerate, um, and in all forms of healthcare. So yes, we're on the cusp of a much more sophisticated consumer, somebody who wants a premium on convenience and transparency. Um, you know, so again, part of that change will be driven. Now, again, how much does dentistry? take up in terms of people's minds and healthcare, that's different. I still think it's fundamentally small because of what we've done for years and decades of siloing the profession. But to my to, to, to the to the main point, it's an opportunity here, right? The changing patient mindset to me is is again a, something that will enable what we're talking about here in terms of ACFF's vision, right? It won't be something that hinders it. Thank you. Any other comments, panel? I think we've got a, a very focused um, view on there's a, a much more direct link in dentistry between prevention and the result than there is in a lot of other healthcare areas. Now, prevention is underfunded globally um, when it comes to any healthcare <laughs> area because policymakers don't see the value in it. And it also seems as though there's a lack of trust of, of dental care professionals not to do anything. They've got to be seen to do something. Um, and that's an attitude that we need to, to change. Final comment from Stephanie. Oh, about the consumers, um, we have a good example in Colombia they were able, the moms were able to set a new law in the country to have labels in the junk food so parents would know about it. So I think it's a, again about change behavior a lot. And it will be, of course, as Mark also said, boss for good. Okay, well, uh, we, that, that's the conclusion of our panel discussion, and I I, mean, I personally enjoyed it enormously. Thank you all for your contributions. Very wide ranging. Um, I have a couple of points. Um, all the uh, talks that you, you saw earlier and the panel discussion will be available on the Summit website until Friday. And thereafter, they would, will be available through the ACFF website provided you are a member of ACFF. And there's, if you go to the ACFF website, that process is very, very easy. Um, now, if you, have, uh, if you wish to claim uh, CPD hours, you can do so by completing the forum feedback and summary form. And the link of, for that can be found on the video library page of the forum microsite under additional resources. So if you go to the um, video library page, under additional resources, you'll get that uh, form feedback and summary, and that's the key to getting your CPD. And the, my final duty is to pass to um, Professor Nigel Pitts, who wishes to give some reflections. Thank you very much, Tim. Um, and thank you to everybody. Um, my, my reflections are very brief, but my thank yous are not. Uh, I want to thank each and every one of our speakers uh, those present in London and those present virtually who, but for the pandemic, would have been in London. Uh, we appreciate your time. We appreciate your input and your wisdom. And I, I think it's really helpful that we've had this forum, which gives us a number of, of lines that we will take forward. I want to thank Tim Walter. I'd like to thank you, our uh, virtual global audience. Um, we know that at the start of this, we had 46 countries with us, and I think probably that number is now increased, and we'll have more people watching later on. So it really is a pleasure that we can use digital technologies to have this as a means 
flavors of and this conversation goes much wider than the business of the My takeaway, my overview, is that despite the devastating consequences of the pandemic, this really has provided some lessons and the presentation that my friend Jake provided really set those out in a good way to understand what some of the different countries to understand the global policy agenda. There are some lessons about change, attitudes to change, and series of opportunities, and those are opportunities that we can take to our step towards having a good future, and that we can do that and embrace that. I also think that today is showing the value of caring and understanding what we're doing in the first place. So, thanks to all of you for coming out. I look forward to the closing session. I invite you to continue doing what you want to do.